Okay, hello and welcome everyone to this team FRCR2B external viva session. And today for the session, we are very pleased to have Dr. Najia, who recently cleared her to be exams in the March attempt. She was a very regular member of the March prep sessions. And uh, we are honored that she um, agreed to take an external session today. She's a consultant radiologist in Ikra International Hospital, India. Dr. Najia, without wasting any more time, uh, the screen is yours and Dr. Ruby would, you, would be your first candidate. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sabahat. Dr. Ruby, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, okay. So this was a 40 year old patient who is in the ICU and his complaints of uh, red foot. Your thoughts? Okay, so this is, these are the X-ray both foot frontal projection mm -hmm. uh, in a patient who is in the ICU, okay. So I could appreciate there is uh, evidence of a periarticular osteopenia mm -hmm. that is predominantly involving the proximal interphalangeal joints as well as distal interphalangeal joints. So I'm looking for the, the changes appears to be bilateral and is a bilateral symmetrical. And now I'm looking for any erosions, which I am unable to appreciate. Okay, and, do you think uh, these are uh, bilateral feet or do you think these are uh, same foot? The same? Yeah, 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 okay, 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 yeah, yeah. And um, there is some overlying soft tissue swelling mm -hmm. at the level of the joints, mm -hmm. and um, I don't see any evidence of acroosteolysis. Mm -hmm. And there is no erosions. Joint spaces appears to be maintained. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, similar changes are seen within the tarsal bones as well. Um, my differentials in this case, it, it doesn't look to me as a rheumatoid arthritis. There are no erosion and joint spaces are maintained. There's just juxtardicular osteopenia and some soft tissue swelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, doesn't look like psoriasis. It could be um, it could be a, a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, okay. like atrophy. As the patient is maybe he's prolonged bedridden ICU patient. That's could be the cause. Maybe we had earlier trauma before and he's not moving. Okay. So so um, I'll see the previous yes. X-rays in detailed history and mm -hmm. a referral to orthopedician for further management. Okay, any differential that you would like to offer? Um, rheumatoid arthritis, as I said, which is less likely without the erosions and joint space narrowing, psoriasis, and which is also less likely as I'm not seeing any bone proliferation, no periostitis, no acroosteolysis, and the other could be reters, which is also less likely. Okay, sure, let's go to the next case. Uh, would you like to uh, request for uh, remote control? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to control now? Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, okay. So this was a patient who has undergone nephrectomy and now for routine follow-up. Okay. So I'm provided with the contrast enhanced scan of the CT abdomen and mm -hmm. I'm scrolling craniocordially. This is the arterial phase in a patient who had the earlier nephrectomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could appreciate there are multiple cystic areas are seen involving the body, tail and the head of the pancreas. Okay, so there was, there's a left nephrectomy and there's uh, the exophytic cyst rising from the lower pole of the right kidney. But I could appreciate there is a soft tissue density mass, which is seen mm -hmm. along, which is seen arising from the posterior aspect of the right kidney, okay. which is highly concerning for the RCC. And there are other... Uh, RCC? RCC? I mean, renal cell carcinoma. 
Okay. And it could be a synchronous lesion as the patient had an earlier history of RCC, renal cell carcinoma. Okay. And there are multiple other lesions, which also appears to be complex cystic lesion. These are not simple cyst, as I could appreciate mm -hmm. septations within and some, uh, some soft tissue density within, which are okay. also con highly concerning. And mm -hmm. now coming back to the pancreatic cyst and uh, there is no evidence of peripancreatic fat stranding. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for any calcifications. There is, there are no significant calcifications. I don't see any obvious mass. It's the, the cysts are involving the whole of the pancreas. Okay. And I'm scrolling quarterly to see any other uh, It, uh, the probably patient could have, there are multiple cysts in the right kidney. So patient could have the other cystic uh, disease. Uh, Mike, what are you thinking of? Uh, I didn't see any cyst within the liver. I was thinking of polycystic liver uh, kidney disease, but the kidney is not enlarged, the right one. Okay. And there could be other syndromic associations like... Uh, uh, von hippel lindau in which case we could see multiple cysts in the spleen and the liver. Okay, um, so what would you do next? Uh, first, I will review the patient's previous record. What was the cause mm -hmm. for the left nephrectomy? Okay. And uh, this patient needs further evaluation as there is another suspicious lesion within the right kidney. Okay. And uh, so patient needs... Uh, Further evaluation with the MRI mm -hmm. or uh, and the why, why MRI? MRI of what? MRI of the abdomen to see okay. any. I, I think these are the simple cysts within the pancreas. I don't see. Okay, so pancreas. evaluation of the pancreatic lesions, right? Pancreatic lesion, yeah. And the okay, uh, okay. renal lesion. So, lesions. what is your uh, provisional diagnosis uh, from this? What are you okay. thinking of? What will you tell? the clinician, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking, first of all, I'm concerned about the renal lesion, the right okay. renal lesion, which is highly concerning that needs further evaluation, biopsy and confirmation, histopathological confirmation. And pancreatic okay. cyst uh, doesn't look to me as a, uh, it could be syndromic association. They are not very concerning about, I don't see any mass within. And, okay. Uh, so patient needs further imaging, especially for the right kidney and the, for workup for the metastasis as he's okay. a known nephrectomy case. Okay. okay, you can go to the next case, please. Okay, so this is a patient who has presented with neck pain. Okay, so I'm provided with the... Um, X-ray of the neck, the cervical spine, frontal and the lateral projections. And uh, can I have a look on the lateral view? Uh, do you want to comment on anything on the frontal? Do you see anything? Okay. Grossly, I didn't see anything. Okay. The spine looks unremarkable from the AP projection. I don't see any soft tissue abnormality. Looking at the visualized clavicle and the upper ribs also appears unremarkable. Uh, okay, you can have a look at the lateral, please. Okay, the lateral view. There is some soft tissue thickening in the prevertebral region in the lower cervical spine. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what are the normal limits for the prevertebral uh, so soft tissue? The you know soft the measurements, yeah. In the lower, yeah, in the so lower cervical spine, it's around twenty mm, or roughly, it should be a half of the vertebral body width. Yeah. I think around twenty or twenty-one millimeters. So it okay. looks more than that. It's more than okay. the width of the vertebral body. Okay. And uh, so this needs further evaluation with the CD scan. So what are you thinking of? 
What do you and think? It could be a collection, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be an abscess. It could be a hematoma. It could be a mass. Okay. Do you want to take a look at the spine, the vertebral bodies, once again? Sure. Okay. Looking at the uh, the atlantoaxial distance is unremarkable. Looking at C three vertebral body, I could appreciate there is some ill-defined lucency involving mm -hmm. the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. And uh, the rest of the vertebral body's heights are maintained. Intervertebral disc spaces are maintained. And looking at the facet joints, probably there is, there is, yes, in the, at the level of two, three, four, five, six, seven, between C6 and C7, there is subtle mm -hmm. uh, step, mm -hmm. facet joints could be, uh, mm -hmm. that could be a facet joint injury. Okay, it's, there is no history of trauma. Okay. Then I'm concerning for the soft tissue thickening and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see anything else. Looking at the calvaria bones of the skull looks unremarkable. Um, okay, so you would like to do a CT or an MRI? What would you prefer? Okay, as I'm not provided with the history. and um, The history is neck pain. I have given you the history, it's neck pain. Okay, so it's non-specific type of a history. So MRI. And what would you be looking for exactly on the MRI? I'm especially concerned about the soft tissue thickening whether that's mm -hmm. neoplastic, that's collection, that's uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Though I am not seeing anything, uh, no, yeah, that's for that. So this is the MRI and I'll give you the situated T2. You may scroll through, please. Okay. So MRI T2 sagittal images. Yeah. And I could appreciate there is a lot of abnormal signal intensity seen in the prevertebral region mm -hmm. with associated abnormal signal within the C2. There are multiple levels shows the abnormal signal intensity at the level of C2, C3 vertebral body and in between C6 and C7. There is loss of intervertebral disc space and there is abnormal signal within the adjacent vertebral bodies. There are multiple vertebral body levels are involved with associated prevertebral soft tissue swelling, which is seen extending from the level of C1 up to the upper thoracic level, I think. And there is a epidural component as well, which is compressing the spinal cord at the level of the, I think, C5, 6 level. And... Uh, the cord also shows thickening at that level. And I would like to assess the contrast enhanced study as well to see. I'm concerned about this could be infective. Mm -hmm. or, you have the contrast, you can see. Okay, through. so contrast enhanced study shows the peripheral rim enhancement of the connection in the prevertebral mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. And that is yeah, extending from the upper cervical up to the low upper thoracic region from the, mm -hmm. and with associated significant erosion, destruction of the vertebral bodies with, with epidural component is also seen at the level of C2 vertebral body, which is compressing the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is most likely an infective collection and I'm mm -hmm. more in favor of um, tuberculosis. Okay. And uh, the patient needs urgent referral to the neurology team mm -hmm. for further evaluation. Is it the neurologist that you would inform? Who would you contact? Because of the uh, cord compression, yeah, neurology and ortho team both should be involved. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can go to the next one, please. Okay, so this is a child, a seven-month-old child who has come with cough. 
they wanted to rule out if there's any patch or any consolidation. Okay. So this is the X-ray chest in a skeletal immature patient who presented with cough. And I could appreciate there are multiple fractures are seen involving the posterior aspect of the ribs, especially on the left side, starting from the fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight ribs, and also mm -hmm. on the right side as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think six and seven ribs on the right side as well. So posterior mm -hmm. rib fractures, these are highly concerning for the non-accidental injuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll alert the pediatricians about, so to take the detailed history or patient urgent skeletal survey should also be done for this child. And depending on the mm -hmm. neurological status, the child also needs a CT scan as not on the neurological, I think he's seven, less than a seven months. So he needs a CT mm -hmm. brain as well. And the social mm -hmm. security services should also be alerted. Okay, you can go through the CT brain that has been done. Okay, so CT scan brain, non-enhanced scan shows there is a hyperdensity within the superior sagittal sinus. Is it within the superior sagittal sinus? Yeah, that's what... Um, Now it's it's actually a subdural collection, which is extending the midline anteriorly and posteriorly, and with associated uh, brain Would edema. Would you call it a collection? Would you call it a collection? Hematoma. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry, I said collection. Okay, it's subdural okay. hematoma with associated brain edema in the form of subtle effacement of the general cortical cell size. Okay. And so that does is more, this support your diagnosis? Or? Yeah, that confirms the that's more in favor of the non-accidental injury and the okay. urgent okay. urgent referral to the pediatric team. I'll I'll, I'll um, urgently inform them, and the child needs skeletal survey and and he, sh he should be he should, he should I, I won't let them to go to the home, and he should mm -hmm. be admitted in the hospital for further management. Okay. Okay, uh, other than skeletal survey, anything else that you would like in terms of imaging once you've seen the CT? MRI should also be done. MRI, MRI of the also? brain. brain. Uh, and? MRI of the brain and spine. Okay, okay, you can go to the next case. Yeah, patient presented with cough. Okay. Chest X-ray frontal projection in an elderly patient presented with cough. Why do you uh, say elderly? I think the skeleton appears to me of uh, adult patient. Just from okay. the gross look, doesn't look a okay. child. Yeah, but elderly. Uh, you meant to but say adult patient, I think. Adult yeah. patient, right? Okay. So there are areas of uh, airspace opacification in the left lung involving the mid and the lower zones, mm -hmm. and as well as the upper zone. And there is the, the left heart border appears to be indistinct. I don't see any evidence of a pleural effusion. And there is a pleural thickening seen along the left upper hemithorax or um, could be, I think it's a large cavitating lesion in the left upper hemithorax. And, Would you uh, want to rephrase it, hemithorax? Do you think it's- It's left lung, okay. sorry, okay. left lung, okay. yeah. Okay. And okay, yeah. The right lung grossly appears unremarkable. I don't see any abnormality within the right lung. Mm -hmm. Both hyla are, uh, the right hilum appears to be slightly pulled down, otherwise it's, uh, the hyla are okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any evidence of pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. Okay. And so this patient presented with cough, so I think it could be an infective consolidation or it could be a neoplastic. Where is the consolidation? Which part is the consolidation that you're talking about? In the left, mid, and the lower zone, it looks an infective, infective process. 
But okay. I'm concerned about the cavitating lesion in the left upper lung, which mm -hmm. needs uh, further evaluation in the adult patient. It could be a malignancy as well, cavitating mass yeah. or cavitating pneumonia. Okay, so, so when you see a cavitating lesion, what are your differentials? It could be cavitating, it could be an abscess, it could be a, a malignancy, mm -hmm. it could be a cavitating mass, mm -hmm. it could be a pneumatocele, then or uh, okay. pediatric age group, the differences might change. Okay, okay. So what would you do next? CT contrast enhanced CT scan of the chest. Okay. Uh, do you think the right upper zone looks uh, normal? Left. The, the right upper zone. You told me that the right the, zone is normal. Okay. At the level of the... Uh, at, the, at the level of the, between the second and the third rib, there is some soft tissue, mm -hmm. which I ignored because I thought it's calcification within the rib. So okay. that, yeah, that could be a soft tissue lesion in the right lung. Okay, okay. So there is just, uh, it's just a spot image. Do you want to comment on it? Yeah. Okay, so CT scan confirms the cavitating lesion in the left upper lung. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows surrounding speculations, irregularity, mm -hmm. some architectural distortion. Mm -hmm. And so, and the soft tissue nodule in the right upper lobe as well. Mm -hmm. So this is highly concerning for the malignancy rather mm -hmm. than the infection. And mm -hmm. uh, this patient needs further... Uh, I would in my routine practice, I'll review the full set of images for the CT chest to see any further lesion that might suggest the metastasis. And I'll review the bone window as well to see any evidence of metastasis. And this patient needs a referral to the chest physician for bronchoscopy, mm -hmm. biopsy, or a CT guided biopsy and the okay. discussion in the lung MDT. And okay. so uh, staging based on, okay. So based on this, uh, would you be able to give a uh, in terms of TNM staging, like, do you, can you give what stage this would be? Do you know the Okay, TNM? there is another lesion in the opposite lung, yeah. uh, T4. Okay, okay. Um, do we have time for the next case or should we uh, go yeah, you, uh, you can, doctor, because we have four candidates, Dr. Nadia, so we can take our time. Okay, okay go okay. ahead. Sure, sure. Okay, so this is a patient who has presented with a sudden onset headache and left-sided weakness. I'm sorry, right-sided weakness. Okay. This is the CT scan of the brain in a patient, adult patient who presented with the sudden onset headache and the weakness, sorry, am I right? Sudden onset headache and right-sided weakness, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I could appreciate there is a large hyperdense lesion in, mm -hmm. the, in the left parietal temporal region. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is surrounding low attenuation that suggests the edema. It is mm -hmm. seen extending up to the cortical, subcortical region. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there, the ventricles appears normal, no evidence of hydrocephalus. Maybe there is minimal mass effect from surrounding edema. And I'm scrolling up. Yeah, there is some mass effect on the left lateral ventricle. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the posterior fossa, I don't see any other lesion or other, anywhere in the cerebral hemispheres. So there is a large uh, hyperdense lesion with surrounding edema and uh, some mass effect over the ventricles. Uh, my differential could be, this could be, um, it could be a hemorrhage within the neoplasm. Okay. And um, it doesn't give the appearance of the infarction. I'm more concerned about the hemorrhage from the underlying, either there is an AVM or mm -hmm. any vascular malformation, or it's a neoplastic lesion, which mm -hmm. has bled. And then this patient needs MRI for further evaluation. 
Okay, so the patient was hypertensive. So the clinician wants to know if this could be just a hypertensive bleed. What do you think? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's not the site for hypertensive bleed. Okay, what are the usual sites we expect for hypertensive? It bleed? used to be in the in the in the basal ganglia region in one time. Okay, okay. So what would you do next? MRI. MRI. Okay. Drust enhanced MRI. Which sequence do you want? Um, flare. Okay, you can scroll. Okay, so this is the MRI of the brain flare images, and I could appreciate a mass in the. Okay. Okay, so I could appreciate there is an abnormal signal intensity mass in the left posterior, right to temporal region with significant surrounding edema, which has significantly progressed in comparison mm -hmm. to the previous CT scan, with significant mm -hmm. mass effect and midline shift. Mm -hmm. And it appears hyper, it's, it's gives a mixed signal of ISO and hyper intensity within, and yeah. surrounding edema appear hyper intense. There is uh, uncle herniation as well. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down to see any, yeah, there's no Donsler herniation. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for any other lesion which I'm unable to appreciate. So, can I have a look on the post contrast? Yeah, yeah, you can have a look at the post contrast. Yeah, that one. Okay, so contrast enhanced study shows the heterogeneous predominantly peripheral rim enhancement. Mm -hmm. And the, it's the, the rim appears to be thick walled, nodular, and irregular, and with yeah. significant uh, surrounding edema. And uh, so this is highly concerning for the malignant lesion. I'm more concerned about the GBM, glioblastoma multiform. Mm -hmm. And this, and uh, this patient needs urgent referral to the neurology team as there is significant compression over the ventricles with uncle herniation. And so further, uh, for further evaluation, he needs the urgent. Okay, any differential other than a high-grade glioma? Other differential could be a large metastatic lesion. Okay. And, uh, so you would uh, refer the patient to the... Urgent reference, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is a patient who has uh, undergone fixation and uh, one month back, and now the patient has presented with pain. The patient had a fracture, scaphoid, yeah. and he's undergone fixation. And now the patient has got pain. Okay. So I'm provided with the x ray left wrist frontal projection. In a patient who had a grievous fracture of the scaphoid, okay, so I could appreciate the internal fixation rod in the mm -hmm. region of the scaphoid, and now he is presented with pain. So I'm concerned about uh, the avascular necrosis of the scaphoid. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I have a look on the other views? Sure, you can have a look. Um, I can't. You can appreciate there is a sclerosis which is seen involving the scaphoid. Mm -hmm. And uh, in comparison to the other carpal bones, yes, there is a sclerosis, which mm -hmm. is concerning for the vascular necrosis. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to assess the MRI of the patient for my confirmation of my findings and uh, I'm not sure there are subtle lucencies within the capitate and hemate as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, So when the there is a long-standing non-union of the scaphoid, uh, what are the changes that we can expect in the wrist? Okay, because of immobilization, there can be Osteoarthritic changes, or uh, okay. I'm not sure. 
Okay, okay. So you would uh, suggest an MRI? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think uh, these were the cases that uh, I had for you. How did you find the cases, Dr. Ruby? Okay, <laughs> not too easy. <laughs> Okay, okay. So I think this is the first session, no? like the external session. So um, yeah. we'll just quickly uh, discuss. So yeah, this was a non-union. So this is actually a scaphoid uh, non-union advanced collapse. Okay, it's a snack, snack wrist. So like you picked up these, there are lucencies within the capitate. There is reduction of the joint space, the uh, radio scaphoid, right? And even these joint spaces, if you see the intercarpal joints, the joint spaces are narrowed with these leucencies. This is called the scaphoid non-union advanced collapse. It's the next stage when there's a long-standing non-union because of the altered biomechanics, you get this. It's basically a degenerative change that you get. So they would go ahead and do like a carpectomy for this patient. So this is a snack wrist. And um, this was, yeah, rightly picked up. So this, uh, I think on the CT, uh, rather than saying a bleed uh, from a lesion, I mean, you describe it as a lesion with bleed, but you know, it could be an AVM like you told. So I think the better way would be to just classify this as a lobar hemorrhage that is seen in the left temporal region. And then you can give the causes that it would be an AVM, an underlying lesion and all of that, but it was correct. I mean, you got the diagnosis. And um, this would be an urgent neurosurgical referral, right? Not a neurological referral because of the mass effect and the uncle herniation. So we would refer it to the neurosurgery because we need to go in and relieve this, right? Right, right. Yeah, so uh, neurology would be just, uh, you know, mannitol on all the anti-edema measures, but you will have to involve the neurosurgery because there is a significant uncle herniation, there is midline shift. So uh, just that, you know, just that it would be a neurosurgical referral rather than a neurological referral, right? Yeah. But uh, otherwise, yeah, you've picked it well. And yeah, so this was a thick walled cavity that we are seeing over here. So again, like you give, uh, you know, we need to give the differentials. So we need to tell them like, these are the differentials I'm thinking of. And then uh, we would uh, do a CT and you picked it up. So when there is a lesion in the other lung, it becomes M1. It's metastasis actually, it's not T4, it's M1. So uh, I think uh, we need to be very clear with the TNM staging of lung cancer. And uh, this was yes, non-accidental injury. And uh, we would do a skeletal survey. So you told all of that. And when we get the CT brain, uh, just uh, when there is a finding, you have to automatically say that, you know, we would do an MRI of the brain and spine no matter what the age of the patient, right? But okay. uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. So we need to tell that like before being prompted, we need to tell them. And uh, we need to be careful with what we, like we cannot say hyperdensity within the superior sagittal sinus. Because if you see the sinus is there, this mm. is, you know, surrounding the sinus, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, and uh, we shouldn't say subdural collection because every word we say, we have to be very careful, you know? So I know what you're thinking, but you need to mm. say the correct terms, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, any, any finding that you, if you get a positive CT, then irrespective of the age, you, we have to do an MRI brain and spine. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, Okay, so when we are given a, uh, an image, first you have to comment on the image before asking for the next image, mm -hmm. all right? You have to tell, even if you don't find anything, you have to tell, I'm looking at the vertebrae, I'm looking at the spinous processes, the ribs, the visualized lungs, and then I do not, uh, you know, see anything and I would like to have a look at the lateral. So first we comment on whatever image is given, you may or may not find anything on that, but we, before going to the next one, you always have to comment on what you see. And uh, like you told, yeah, so this is 22 up to C4, 7 mm, C4, below C4, 22 mm, or one vertebral body width. It's not half, it's one vertebral body width. And this is definitely more than that. Mm. So again, when we see, when we see something, you have to give the differentials. So what are your differentials before suggesting a CT or an MRI? We always have to give our differentials. In fact, for every case, you know, you need to give in terms of, observation, interpretation, different uh, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and management, right? 
So we right. always need to give a differential. So, you know, you've given all the differentials, but instead of, you know, the waiting for somebody to prompt you, it's better if you just, you know, uh, have that habit of giving the differentials before asking for the next thing. And always be very careful. Like there were subtle findings in this, you know, and uh, like you said, there was some, uh, there is some incongruity of the facet joints because there is a gibbous deformity, which is seen with tuberculosis, right? In spondylodiscitis, we can see the gibbous. So it is not very obvious, but it's a subtle developing thing. And on this, you picked it up well. We have to, uh, there is epidural component, there is a mass effect on the cord. And again, here, it would be a neurosurgical referral, not a neurological referral, right? Because mm. there is mass effect on the spinal cord. So anything when there is mass effect, when there is herniation, it's an urgent neurosurgical referral rather than neurological referral. Right. And uh, also right. Uh, probably you could uh, do a chest x-ray to look at the lungs because, you know, when it's tuberculosis, you want to look at the lungs as well. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. So that is another thing. Um, and, and yeah, so this was, this was a Von Heppel window. You were thinking of Von Heppel window, right? Yeah. But you need to be very firm and you need to tell, okay, this is Von Heppel window. So then when you say it's a syndromic, it's Von Heppel window, then what do you do next? You have to look at the brain, you have to look at the spine, you have to look for hemangioblastomas, right? So mm. when you're thinking of Von Heppel window, you have to look at the other associations. You have to do a family screening, you know, a genetic testing, you need to do all of that. So we look at the syndrome as such. And uh, like you told, you know, you have to compare with the previous. And you know, this is a renal cell carcinoma. Uh, we should not use abbreviations, right? RCC, no such abbreviations are to be used in the exam. So out of habit, we have this, we, you know, we'll tell RCC, we tell mm. HL, but, you know, we have to abstain from using such abbreviations. And uh, so for all the, not just this, all the, you know, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, everything, we need to say, you know, look at the brain, look at the hey. associations. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Doctor Ruby, you there? Hello. Uh, go ahead, Doctor Naji. Maybe she muted herself, uh, but you can uh, you can keep uh, okay, going. Okay, okay. Yeah, and this was uh, pseudix uh, uh, dystrophy. Uh, and um, the other differential that we can give is uh, disuse osteopenia since the patient is in ICU. And the way to differentiate would be uh, with the clinical features because when it is a disuse osteopenia, then the patient will need uh, physical therapy. So the, you know we have to give these two differentials and depending on the clinical features, the clinician will decide what is to be done. But uh, apart from that, yeah, I think she got all the diagnosis and um, it was good. Yeah, I think we can go to the next candidate. Yes, okay. thank you very much, Dr. Ruby. Very well done. Uh, thank you, Dr. Naji, for the cases. Next is Dr. Asit. Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Asit? Yes, hi. Hi. Hi, hi, Dr. Asit. Hi, Are you Dr. ready? Hi, hi. Should we start? Yes. Okay, yeah, this is your first case. So this is the frontal chest radiograph of an adult patient. Uh, the striking abnormality I can see is an opacity in the right upper lung with mm -hmm. ipsilateral shift of the trachea. And there mm -hmm. is uh, an convexity along the anterior margin uh, of this region. And there is uh, some volume loss if comparing to the opposite side and uh, ipsilateral diaphragm is also showing up for displacement. So I'm concerned about uh, right upper lobe collapse with mm -hmm. possibility of uh, golden as sign uh, due to underlying uh, tumor. So mm -hmm. the, the left lung appears unremarkable. I don't see any mm -hmm. obvious uh, bony lesions. So mm -hmm. uh, if this is the first presentation, then I, I would suggest uh, uh, flag this uh, uh, case uh, for further mm -hmm. uh, to the referring clinician and it needs mm -hmm. urgent CT chest uh, with contrast uh, and uh, staging CT chest uh, run, uh, rapid lung pathway 
uh, including chest and upper abdomen for further management. Okay, uh, so you said secondary to a tumor. Where is the expected location of the tumor? Uh, I think it is uh, in the uh, in the right hilum. Right hilum. Okay, and uh, you said there are no bony uh, lesions. Would you like to look at the clavicles once again? Uh, okay. So if we compare with the clavicle on the left side, there is mm -hmm. some. The right clavicle is showing some uh, irregularity along the inferior margin. So uh, I suspect there is uh, involvement of uh, this. Uh, so this is concerning for metal, metastatic as well. So yeah, so uh, it needs further evaluation with CT and uh, needs to flag this. Okay, or, would you like to give, would you like to offer any differential for this case? Uh, my top differential is uh, lung tumor. Uh, mm -hmm. as there is uh, involvement of this uh, rib lesion as well, uh, mm -hmm. or the clavicle as well. Mm -hmm. The other differential can be uh, a collapse due to uh, mucus plug, uh, mm -hmm. but which, uh, which is less likely. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, this is a patient who has presented with jaw pain. Okay, so this is uh, X-ray orthopentogram of a patient who has presented with jaw pain. I'm trying to have a look to look, find any obvious abnormality. The only mm -hmm. obvious abnormality I can see is in the left mandible, which mm -hmm. appears a bit sclerotic. Mm -hmm. If we compare on the right side, mm -hmm. uh, and probably there are some, yeah, there is some definite irregularity of the cortex as well mm -hmm. uh, on the left side, uh, mm -hmm. left angle of the mandible. And yeah. uh, I don't see any cortical break. I don't see any associated uh, internal matrix uh, calcifications, uh, no associated uh soft tissue mass or mm -hmm. bony destruction mm -hmm. so uh, the rest of the visualized uh, mandible uh, appeared unremarkable so i first thing i would like to know the history of the presentation and then uh, if the if, history is dropping dropping so uh, if there is no previous images available, then I need to uh, have this, uh, uh, since my uh, differential for these appearances can be osteomyelitis, it can be uh, uh, underlying uh, neoplastic process like osteosarcoma or uvin sarcoma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Langerhand can be a possibility, hysterocytosis. So I need mm -hmm. to uh, flag this again. And mm -hmm. I need to, uh, for further evaluation, I need uh, MRI uh, or CT for further evaluation. Okay, you can uh, ask for the remote control. Okay, let me. Yeah, you can scroll through. Okay, so these are the MRI images of the same patient, coronal stud, mm -hmm. uh, which are showing abnormal uh, signal involving the left mandible uh, in relation to the findings on the XK. And it, it, is, it is showing uh, uh, abnormal, uh, I would like to have a look on the T1 to look for underlying bone involvement, uh, but okay. there is a significant peri-lesional uh, edema on T1, mm -hmm. and I think there is some mass as well, uh, associated mass, or some periosteal 
reaction of periosteal uh, thickening. So, okay. uh, so my differential for the appearance is remain the same. Uh, so okay. uh, I'm. You I'm look at the T one. You wanted the T one, right? So T one is so. Sorry. T one is showing a definitely abnormal marrow signal. Uh, mm -hmm. in the magnet on T1. So this mm -hmm. is suggestive of uh, underlying bone involvement as well. So mm -hmm. my differential would uh, remain uh, osteomyelitis or uh, osteosarcoma, and it mm -hmm. is uh, sarcoma team uh, referral and uh, biopsy. Okay. okay. Okay, this is a child um, in the ICU. Okay, so this is the frontal chest radiograph of a child who is in ICU. I can see there are multiple lines, endotical tube is in C tube, uh, which is rightly sighted, and NG tube is, uh, uh, is normally sighted. But the striking abnormality is I can see there is a, a evidence of lucency below the diaphragm, which is suspicious for uh, a pneumoperitoneum. And mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, umbilical arterial or venous catheter as well. In the venous catheter is, uh, the arterial catheter is probably at the right side. I would like to uh, have a further review uh, of these uh, uh, for, with the abdominal radiograph, but I need to flag this uh, pneumoperitoneum and, mm -hmm. uh, urgently. And there is mm -hmm. no evidence of pneumothorax. There are some mm -hmm. changes in the lungs which are concerning for uh, some probably uh, uh, underlying uh, highline membrane disease or some granulation in the mm -hmm. lung. And but mm -hmm. no evidence of pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. So I need mm -hmm. to flag this for evaluation of pneumoperitoneum. Okay. So the uh, X-ray abdomen is uh, confirming my finding of a uh, pneumoperitoneum uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the umbilical arterial and venous catheter. Uh, I think I'm the venous catheter appears to be uh, within the liver, I believe, uh, okay. wrongly cited. So I need to flag this one as well. Uh, okay. For what is the cited. ideal position? So ideally, it should be it should be uh, along the right side of, of uh, uh, in the uh, I think at level of T seven to T T nine, and it should not be the tip should be should not be projecting uh, into the liver. Mm -hmm. and, and what about the arterial catheter? And the, the arterial spinal? catheter, uh, the, uh, it should be left of the spine and it should be at the level of T7 to T10. And I think it is- So is it correct position? Okay, okay. So what do you think is the cause for the pneumoperitoneum? Probably this uh, wrongly placed uh, umbilical venous catheter. That might be the reason. Or, or there are within the uh, bowel loops, yeah. So there is pneumot, pneumot uh, I think there is uh, intermural air as well. Yeah, definitely. So this is where, the reason for a pneumatosis. Where is the pneumatosis? Which uh, part of the abdomen? Can you see my... Yes, but explain it to me. Where is it? Where so would you this, localize? So this, is, the... this is the... Uh, in the right lower abdomen. And okay. it is uh, uh, in part of uh, the bowel. Which is out, okay. uh, which is showing some uh, lucency along its uh, superior margins, which is concerning for pneumatosis or. Uh, okay, so what is your final diagnosis? So my final diagnosis is uh, uh, this uh, pneumatosis with pneumoperitoneum, and mm -hmm. it needs uh, urgent uh, referral to the pediatric team. Okay, what do you think is the age of this patient? It's a, it's a neonate, uh, I believe. 
It's a neonate, uh, right. So, you know, putting all this, what is the final diagnosis? What are you thinking of? Uh, the finding uh, in the chest and the abdomen, so. Uh, pseudomembranous colitis and uh, this, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I, sorry, you said I, pseudomembranous colitis? I, I think I just, I'm just- Okay, you told close. that, okay, okay, no problem, let me help you. Uh, so on this, you said in the lungs, it looks like highland membrane disease, right? Okay, so yeah. let, let me ask you, is this a term, do you think this is a term or a preterm infant? Yeah, looking at the uh, margins of uh, the humeral uh, head epiphysis, I don't see mm -hmm. the epiphysis are visualized. So it, okay. it appears to be a preterm with neonat. So okay. in the preterm, there is the, these, uh, I, I skipped the name of this condition, but this okay. is very okay. common and it needs uh, a dose of okay. to pneumoperitone. Okay, okay. What would they do? Do you know what would be the management? For the pneumoperitoneum, I, I think they have to uh, keep, an, uh, keep a look uh, on the progression. Okay, okay. So this is a young patient who has presented with cough. Okay, so this is a young adult who has presented with cough. Mm -hmm. uh, the striking abnormality I can identify on this image is in the right hilum. I can see there is a, a lesion. Uh, Probably it's cavitating. It appears to be. Can you show me what, uh, which is the lesion that you're talking about? I'm talking okay. about this. Uh, th that, uh, that's just the vessel marking. I just the vessel marking, it. okay. Yeah. So then I need to, uh, I don't see any obvious abnormality on this radiograph. I need to go through my review areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right. So starting from the bones mm -hmm. and the left side, I can see there is an obvious. Uh, I can identify there is some soft tissue thickening in the left mm -hmm. supraclavicular region. Mm -hmm. uh, if we compare on the right side here, yeah, definitely, and and mm -hmm. the left scapula is margin is irregular or ill-defined, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm barely uh, able to identify it. Yeah, so definitely. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the abnormality and uh, the rest of the lungs are clear. I don't see any obvious lung lesion, no evidence on pneumothorax, no, no mediastinal or hyaline lymph nodes, no pleural effusion. So uh, mm -hmm. I would like to correlate uh, with uh, previous imaging if possible. Uh, mm -hmm. And otherwise, I need further imaging for this left shoulder, uh, including the left scapula and left clavicle. Okay. Uh, and, so there was no uh, further x ray, but uh, I have the MRI. Uh, which sequence would you like to see? I would like to have a look on T1 first. There is a sagittal T1. You can scroll through. Okay, so sagittal T1 is showing uh, abnormal marrow signal within the scapula, mm -hmm. and there is. So I would like to have a look on star as now and T1 post contrast. You can go the rest, the two images, yeah. Okay. So start signal, uh, there is a, a, a normal start signal uh, mm -hmm. and with involving the scapula with associated uh, mass uh, as well. And the post contrast. There is no post contrast. We don't, contrast. We don't have post contrast. Okay. Yeah. So these yeah. uh, these are uh, um, 
So again, uh, my my concern would be uh, a scapular uh, neoplastic lesion, like mm -hmm. uh, scapular Ewing uh, uh, sarcoma is a okay. is, because since it's a flat bone, and then mm -hmm. uh, the other differential can be a plasma cytoma. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, osteocytoma. Do you think this is an old, uh, do you, what do you think is the age of the patient? Do you think this is an older patient that, or a younger patient? I think the patient age is uh, probably in the 20 to 30s, yeah. Okay, would you still consider plasma cytoma? No, uh, then osteosarcoma or uh, then uh, Less likely. Uh, okay. So uh, Langer hand, Langer hand can be a possibility. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What would you do next? So I I will flag this page, uh, the this to the sarcoma team, and uh, mm -hmm. for biopsy and staging CT uh, CT chest abdo pelvis, and uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is a newborn baby who has presented with vomiting. Okay, so newborn who has presented with vomiting. Uh, mm -hmm. I can see anti tube is in situ, which appears uh, within the stomach. Just checking abnormality, I can identify there is a uh, uh, paucity of the power loops, and there are some dilated loops of bowel, which appear to be stomach and proximal uh, small bowel, uh, mm -hmm. because topic deposity of the bowel loop is in the left hemi abdomen, and I don't see any any uh, gas distally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there is no evidence of pneumoperitoneum and mm -hmm. uh, no other concerning features. Mm -hmm. So my top differential with, for these appearances uh, is uh, uh, bubble uh, atesia. It looks, it appears to be a triple bubble sign, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, suggestive of underlying vaginal uh, atesia. And okay. uh, I, I, I would like, I would urgently uh, flag this patient to. To for pediatric team referral and uh, uh, evaluation with uh, follow through examination for confirmation. Okay. <clears throat> so, can I go through the images? Yeah, yeah, you may go through. Okay, so I'm just going to the meal follow through images of the same child. So these are showing uh, dilated loops of uh, bowel, uh, including mm -hmm. the stomach, and mm -hmm. uh, which is showing abrupt uh, truncation in the region of uh, distal jejunum, I would say. Mm -hmm. so, Do you think it's a distal jejunum? I think it's proximal jejunum, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so it, it is, uh, again, uh, uh, I think it, it is very much suggestive of jejunal underlying jejunal atesia, since okay. it is associated with, uh, uh, and there is no uh, tear or uh, no contrast uh, distal to this, so we mm -hmm. need to uh, rule out distal bowel uh, obstruction as well, uh, like microcolon, which is an association with this. So mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, investigation I would advise is to have uh, a contrast anima for this child. Okay, so the contrast anima is confirming uh, uh, evidence of microcolon. And uh, 
Yeah. So uh, and with the and the, these are uh, yeah. So uh, the these are consistent with my uh, provisional diagnosis of uh, jejunal atresia. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this needs uh, urgent uh, refer to the pediatric uh, surgical team uh, for okay. for the management. Okay. Uh, so, uh, any other uh, differential that you would like to give? The other differential for these appearances uh, include uh, my uh, uh, meconium ileus, or uh, that uh, gives this appearance. But in meconium mm -hmm. ileus, we uh, do have uh, contrast reaching up to the distal ileum. Okay. So, any other uh, history that you would ask for to uh, differentiate between digital atresia and meconium ileus? And meconium ileus does have association with cystic fibrosis as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, I would like to know if the patient has that history. Or... This is a newborn, right? Would we get a history of cystic fibrosis? <laughs> no, no. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. Uh, so Anything sorry, else no. That you would yeah. Uh, okay, okay, no problem. Sorry, not sure. No. Okay, okay, sure, no problem. Mm. Okay, yeah. This is a patient who had a history of fall, so they just come to rule out any fractures, and the patient has a long-standing history. But records are not available. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm presented with the X ray of the knee joint of patient who has long standing history but presented with fall. Stacking abnormality I can see is in the uh, proximal tibia. There is a lattice lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, in the proximal tibial metaphasis, uh, which is uh, showing narrow zone of transition with some areas of internal septations or septi with subcortical scalloping and there is no associated internal uh, calcified matrix, no associated periosteal reaction, no soft tissue mass. And I see there is some uh, cortical abnormality involving the uh, lateral aspect of distal fem femur as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to correlate it with uh, previous images if available. And mm -hmm. uh, but they, I don't see any associated soft tissue mass. Uh, so what are you thinking, doctor? Uh, so I don't see any obvious fractures. Since the patient has presented with uh, history of trauma, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to have a look on the lateral view to see for any joint yes, yes. Yeah. The lateral view is not showing any joint fusion. Mm -hmm. And this lesion is uh, fairly well defined with narrow zone of transition with some internal, uh, probably internal septi or uh, but no definite calcification, calcified matrix. So uh, my differential for these appearance uh, would be uh, mm -hmm. uh, aneurysmal bone cyst, or it can be a joint cell tumor, uh, since it, it is uh, reaching up to the uh, subcortical uh, region. Okay. Uh, although I don't see any uh, associated uh, 
is not eccentric or not showing any peripheral cal calcified margin. And then other differential can be simple bone cyst or um, so if this is, is a, a skeletally mature patient, right? Yeah, it, it it looks like to be a skeletally mature patient. So, so would uh, we expect a simple bone cyst? No, not not in this uh, age group. Okay. So the other other can be uh, um... okay. If I tell you that the patient has history of uh, is a known case of hemophilia. So if it is a known case of hemophilia, then it can mm -hmm. be a hemophilic uh, pseudotumor. Uh, okay. is, uh, uh, is my top differential for this appearance. And I would okay. like to correlate with the previous images and mm -hmm. further evaluation with uh, MRI. Okay, what would you be looking for in the MRI? Uh, in the MRI, we would be looking for any uh, associated, uh, I mean, uh, hemorrhages or soft, soft tissue abnormality uh, as well. Okay, okay. Let's go to the next case. Yeah, patient presented with cough. So this is the frontal chest radiograph of an adult patient who has presented with cough. Striking abnormality I can see is uh, uh, diffuse perihilar uh, areas of reticular nodular vesication, uh, which is predominantly involving uh, upper and uh, middle uh, zones on either side with relative sparing of the cost of any angles. And uh, heart size is normal, no evidence of uh, hyalur uh, or medicinal nephropathy. And uh, rest of the visualized lungs are uh, clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to, uh, yeah. since the patient has presented with cough, I would like to and know if the patient is immunocompromised. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, my differential for these appearances uh, may include uh, pneumocystis uh, pneumonia, if the patient mm -hmm. is immunocompromised, or if mm -hmm. not, then uh, the differential may include uh, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis or alveol uh, alveolar hemorrhage or non-cardiogenic mm -hmm. pulmonary edema. So I would like mm -hmm. to correlate with the clinical presentation and uh, further evaluation with CT chest. Okay, okay. So I think we've come to an end of the cases. Uh, how is it, Dr. Asad? I don't know. I think I did not uh, do well. In your no, process. I think you know, just I think few terms which uh, you were not able to recollect, but I, I think you know, you've done well. So yeah. Uh, this was uh, PCP pneumonia. This patient mm -hmm. was immunocompromised and your differentials were good. Uh, I think one differential that you need to add would be a LCH, a Langhans uh, histiocytosis, right. yeah. because yeah. it's sparing the basis and the costophrenic angle. So uh, like how you told, you know, if the patient is uh, immunocompromised, I would think of PCP. If the patient is a smoker, I would think about LCH. So that is the only uh, other differential. There are small cystic spaces. If, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see. No, yeah. There are small cystic yeah. spaces. Yeah. So uh, that was the only other differential that you need to give. But uh, otherwise, that was fine. And this was, yes, it was a hemophilic pseudotumor. I did not want to give you the history because if I give you the history, it's, uh, you know, it's a very easy case. Then. So these are radiating... Uh, strands, you know, these are what are quite uh, typical for these uh, intra Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Actually, so, the images are uh, very small. So, oh, okay. okay. So, uh, <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, these are those characteristic. Uh, so, strands. yeah, the, the distal femur is, I think, old fracture, I probably. 
sorry this this one yeah 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 that is probably an old fracture yeah old there is still thing yeah yeah there is no acute fracture so that is another thing we need to uh, you did tell you know there is no acute fracture because the patient has presented with uh, trauma so trauma. we should always listen to the history always address whatever is the current problem or the current clinical question mm -hmm. and you know we should not get thrown off by the findings so yeah. you did mention so that was good and um so this was uh, jejunal atresia. So you mm -hmm. correctly picked it up and uh, you told there is no, so always look for the uh, complications. And I think uh, although not covered completely, you may just say the hernial orifices, you know, that yeah. is another thing to just uh, mention, just to show that you have checked. But uh, otherwise, yeah, the barium. So first investigation, and, we can ask for barium. Uh, barium, yes, a water soluble contrast uh, follow through follow through yeah. other than okay. barium a water soluble yeah a water soluble contrast and uh, then you can ask for like a barium enema like you yeah. did yeah. so uh, a meconium ileus so the baby wouldn't pass meconium so that is the history that you would ask for if the baby oh, has passed yes. Yes. meconium yes. or not yeah because uh, jejunal atresia there can still be some meconium in the distal bubble which can be passed Okay. So that is right. the history that uh, we would ask for. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, this was a scapular lesion. Mm -hmm. So always, you know, when we don't see something on the chest, we have to look at the review areas, which you correctly picked up. And uh, on the MRI, again, you have given all the differentials, uh, mm -hmm. the evenings, osteosarcoma and uh, LCH. So that was okay. good. Yeah. And okay, so this was a preterm neonate, right? So when yeah. we get an x ray like this, uh, I think it's better to start off saying, you know, uh, this is a frontal chest uh, radiograph and uh, of what I assume to be a preterm since the humeral yeah. heads are not ossified. Yeah. Whenever we get a pediatric, always look at the humeral heads first because that will uh, then the differential diagnosis varies, right? Because yeah. if it's uh, term or post term, we would think of meconium aspiration. Preterm, we would think of uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always, uh, first and foremost, suggest on the lines and tubes, which you correctly did. And uh, like you told, there is a granular appearance of the lungs, which is mm -hmm. suggestive of uh, respiratory distress syndrome. You did point out none of the complications are there. And then you did correctly pick up the leucency, which is very good. And now coming to this, again, there is a large football sign. Yeah. Uh, suggesting uh, pneumoperitoneum and like you told, the mottled appearance pneumatosis. So this is a necrotizing enterocolitis. Yeah, necrotizing enterocolitis. Yes. Yeah. yes. So um, that is the, so this then becomes a surgical, uh, they have to go. It is, it is surgical is emergency because pneumoperitoneum yes. is there. Yeah. Yes, yes. So it is not conservative and follow up. So that is yeah, why sorry, I asked yeah. you the management. I, yeah. I messed up yeah. there. Yeah, no problem, because I think <laughs> since you didn't get the term, you know, you were a bit uh, mm. thrown off by that. No, no, no issues. So, uh, and this, yes, the umbilical venous catheter, it should be at the junction of the uh, cavo atrial junction, right at the you. IVC and the right atrium. Yeah, so it should yeah. be up here. So this has it's, to be... It's so not you know, in the liver, I think. This is, uh, this is uh, my position. It has to be, uh, you know, advanced. It has this to is be within advanced, the liver. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, because it goes from the umbilical vein into the left portal vein, the ductus venosus, and then uh, the left hepatic vein, IVC, and then it should be at the cable atrial junction. Yeah. So that is the ideal position. So you have to inform them that as well. And uh, this, uh, the malpositioned umbilical venous in arterial catheters would not cause a pneumoperitone. These so you not. did pick it up later, but uh, yeah, so that is another thing. So this was a, a necrotizing atrocolitis with perforation, which then becomes a surgical emergency. If there is no perforation, then again, we will have to inform because they have to withhold feeds. Then oral yeah. feeds are withheld for the baby. So, yeah. And this was also, it was a subtle finding, but again, well picked up. Uh, there is sclerosis, there is some thickening, there is some periosteal reaction that you mm -hmm. can see. And again, the differentials were uh, spot on, Ewing's uh, osteomyelitis and uh, LCH, osteosarcoma, mm -hmm. these would be the differentials. Yeah. And uh, again, this would have to be discussed in the uh, sarcoma, MD, sarcoma, as you told. Yeah. 
and this was a reverse uh, S sign, golden S sign with a hilar mass. So there was a clavicillation, which was subtle, but you know, uh, we have to pick it up because then it changes. And if you see, there's a lesion over here in the ribs as well. Can you see? It's again, uh, I, I don't know. Really see. Yeah, it's just about there. Oh, but yeah. whenever, you know, so before uh, commenting that there are no skeletal metastases, always look carefully. Especially uh, because, yeah. yes, yes. Because other, you know, there would usually be associated findings, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, because you. this is a malignancy. So always look carefully at the uh, contralateral lung, look for effusion, look for uh, rib lesions, you know. Uh, these are usually, that's the kind of cases that we need to be very, uh, very, very careful, right? Yeah, Otherwise, well done, so well done. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Asit. Dr. Yasrab, you are next. Hi, yeah, I'm next. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Who, who's next? Hi. Hi, um, hi. Dr. Okay, hi, hi. Uh, would you like to request for control? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is a patient who has undergone uh, a surgery, an abdominal surgery, and has come for a post-surgical scan. You can scroll through it. Okay. Okay, so this is CT scan abdomen with contrast mm -hmm. of a patient who has undergone recent surgery in which mm -hmm. uh, I'm excluding quadly and I, mm -hmm. I can appreciate there's multiple dilated bowel loops. Pyramidally, the small bowel loops which appear dilated. Mm -hmm. There's some coordination issue with the screen. Let me see. So, okay, sorry. Yeah, so it's not coordinating with my, my. Do you want to use the keyboard? Maybe that will yeah, yeah, I'm trying to use keyboard as well. So I can appreciate there is some hyperdense structure, linear structures, tubular structures can be seen within these, uh, when one of the dilated uh, bowel loop, mm -hmm. and I would like to see its communication with the adjacent bowel loop to uh, look for its site where these, dilated, uh, these structures are located. So the proximal and uh, the distally, so this appear to be uh, collection rather than actual communication with the bowel loop because I don't see any communication of the proximal and distal end of this structure. Okay. Yeah, so I have pressed this structure proximally as well distally. There is no obvious communication with the adjacent bowel loops. However, the dilatation of small bowel loops can be appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is some stranding also seen um, around this structure and there is a, a wall thickening and enhancement of this structure as well. Some air loculi also seen within this structure. And the, the fluid appears slightly hyperdense within this structure. Uh, I would like to uh, know the history of uh, um, surgery and uh, correlate with the surgical notes. Mm -hmm. but what are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking of uh, maybe it is associated with some uh, uh, stomach stent or some stent displacement or some uh, surgery which is related to bowel and then there is a pseudo collection formation around that displaced stent. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Other... So there was no stent. There was no stent done. Okay. Um, it was a hernia, uh, you know, a hernia, hernia repair. Okay, so it was a hernia repair. So I suspect it is an internal hernia repair because I don't see any abnormal um, effect in the anterior abdominal wall. Okay. So, so what do you think be, these hyperdense structures are? This would be mesh, or which is placed for the hernia repair. Okay. Or the uh, hernia could be uh, internal hernia. Okay, for the internal hernia, do they usually uh, place a mesh? Uh, I have no idea about the details of the... Okay, maybe they okay, have put so, some suture or something. Okay, so uh, do you think this is a normal... So what is your final diagnosis on the case? Uh, considering the uh, appearance of this structure and the adjacent bowel loop thickening and dilatation, I think this... Uh, need a surgical evaluation uh, for because I don't think this is a normal uh, appearance on and this as this has no communication with the adjacent uh, visible communication on this scan however I would like to see it on further views in my normal practice and um, this structure is not uh, it also showing some air foci in it so possibility of underlying infection in this could also could not be ruled out this should not be uh, this should be followed up and this should be urgently communicated to the Concerned physician and surgeon. So, uh, but you still did not give me what is your final diagnosis in the case. I think this is maybe an infective uh, process going on, infected collection with some okay. hypertense material in it. Okay, okay. So, like an abscess is what you're thinking. Right? Yeah, yeah. Post surgical complication, maybe. Okay, okay, sure. Yeah. So, this is a, a child who had an abnormal antenatal scan. Your thoughts? Okay, so I'm presented with uh, a nuclear uh, renal scintigraphy scan in which I can appreciate there is uh, uptake can be seen in uh, one of the kidney, which is uh, appear to be enlarged in size as compared mm -hmm. to the control little side. And uh, mm -hmm. this is persist and on the um, uh, on the first scan, there is subtle uptake in the uh, the, the, it shows uptake on the uh, in the initial phases, and there is persistent uptake on the delayed phases, which I, and I appreciate. And I don't see any um, uh, any uh, excretion on the delayed phase, even on the one uh, on the one point four hour image. So this is uh, I'm suspecting any obstruction mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, in one of the kidneys. Mm -hmm. Which kidney um, maybe, do you think it is? I think it is left kidney. Okay. Because, okay. yeah. So, what would you do? What is your... Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to... Yeah, I would like to um, evaluate... Hello? Dr. Yasser, we can't hear you. And associated abnormalities should be ruled out because renal is associated uh, with some... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Could you please repeat yourself? Uh, I think we lost you. Hi, now you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, so I would like to correlate with patients' antenatal scans in which there is... Mm -hmm. uh, to see what structure and abnormality they are suspecting, because in this scan there is definitive uh, functional, uh, there is definitive ob obstruction in mm -hmm. this because I don't see any excretion of the contrast through this kidney, mm -hmm. and uh, would like to correlate with further imaging of a genital system as well because renal abnormalities are associated with genital abnormalities as well. Okay, so what what how would you further image the patient? Um, what imaging would you suggest? Uh, I view. To look for the yeah. genital abnormalities. Sorry? What extra what extra information would you get on the I view? Yeah, uh, give me the, it will give me the exact structural abnormality. What is the level of obstruction is there? 
Let's go to the next case. Yeah. So this is a patient uh, who has presented with uh, abdominal distension. Okay, so I'm present with the uh, uh, frontal radiograph abdomen of adult patient. Uh, on there is a paucity of gas in the center of the abdomen, and subtle gas can be seen into the right iliac fossa. However, no dilatation of bowel loops are observed. Um, one of the gas loop can be seen in the epigastric region left of the midline. I don't see any obvious calcification in the abdomen. There is no uh, lucencies in the biliary tree area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, opacity can be seen. Uh, the soft tissue density can be seen in the pelvis, which could be a distended urinary bladder. OK. Anything else that you're that? seeing on the pelvis, in the pelvis? In the pelvis, uh, maybe some lytic areas are noted in the right uh, pubic uh, remus because uh, this is actually obscure. Let me, okay. So, some lytic areas are observed in the right pubic remus with some ir cortical irregularity. Mm, so, that's okay. It's projection. That's, that's fine. okay. Okay. So, uh, I can see a, a lucent, uh, uh, um, some lucencies in the right obturator foramen um, which could be uh, would, which also could be a projectional but this could be a, a fluid filled bowel loop and it could be causing obstruction of the bowel loops however the gas is not seen in the abdomen because of the fluid filled bowel loop okay okay so what do uh, you do next uh, i would like to uh, image this patient with ct scan to look for obstruction Okay. Yeah, you can scroll through. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is contrast enhanced CT scan abdomen of the same patient in which I can appreciate there is gross abdominal pelvic ascites. Mm -hmm. Uh, NG tube seen in situ. And for this chlorine, some sludge is noted in the gallbladder. No hydronephrosis. Pancreas appear unremarkable. So there is. Bow loops are seen floating in the ascites. And further scrolling down, I can appreciate this extending into the pelvis as well. However, there is no um, obvious herniation of the... Uh, yeah, I can see... No, no, there's no herniation is noted in the mm -hmm. inguinal area. And yeah. this uh, appears, this fluid does appear to be um, intraperitoneal. Mm -hmm. Because uh, so there's gross abdominal pelvic ascites. I would like, uh, want to look for the reason for the ascites. So I'm going back in the pelvis to look for any um, ovarian pathology because this patient is a female patient. Okay. So. Um, there appear to be this. There appear to be a structure uh, adjacent in the right adnexa. Yeah, yeah. Which is showing some uh, uh, tooth like calcification as well as fat density, uh, as well as low. Uh, low density, which I want to mirror on my routine practice, look for if, if it's a fat. Mm -hmm. So it was found to be fat. Uh, then it, I'm suspecting a uh, dermoid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so would that explain the ascites? 
No, no, it won't because uh, Southeast then I would also look for uh, there's a slightly bulky left ovary. However, no, I don't see any mass lesion in the left ovary. Mm -hmm. So, where else would you look? I would look at appendix. Okay. Look for any mucous seal. Mm -hmm. So you think this is a malignant uh, ascites, right? Yeah, it can be a malignant ascites because I don't see any signs of the cirrhosis in the liver uh, and mm -hmm. the kidneys are normal to me. So in that mm -hmm. case, the societies need to be explained. Okay. Because liver margins are smooth. Mm -hmm. And the other possibility is look at the cardiac. I mean, the heart is normal. So the systemic causes are not there. So um, okay. I would like to, yeah, if I'm not, I can't find anything in the scan. Uh, ideally, this is a need to be aspirated and then cytology should be done to look for the reason for the societies. If you can just scroll down to the pelvis. Yeah. Um, okay. What do you think of the peritoneal lining further down? So there is some, in the pelvis, there appear to be some uh, nodular thickening of the peritoneum. Okay. Some enhancement mm -hmm. is there. So does this help you to narrow down your differential? So um, this could be in pseudo maxoma peritonei. One of the other differential other possibilities peritonitis. Okay. Because these are the differential I can offer, right? Okay. Okay. So you would aspirate it and. Yeah, to confirm my diagnosis and. Okay. So this patient presented, doctor of fall. Okay, so I'm presented with uh, uh, frontal radiograph of right humerus of a, a skeletally mature patient in which I can appreciate there is a cortical break into the mid diaphysis of the humerus with slight displacement of the lateral displacement of the distal end of the uh, uh, fracture. And there appear to be some lytic areas as well as some sclerosis within the humerus. So I suspect this to be a pathological fracture. Where are the uh, lytic and sclerotic areas? In the, uh, in the mid part of the uh, diaphysis at, the, at okay. the region of the fracture, I can appreciate some, this is some lytic areas and there is some adjacent sclerosis okay. in the proximal part of the humerus, which is suspicious okay. for underlying bone disease. Okay, so would you be thinking of a benign or uh, an aggressive? Uh, this looks slightly aggressive to me because um, I don't see, I'm not suspecting a simple bone cyst because the sclerotic areas, the superiorly is not supporting the diagnosis of a simple bone cyst leading to this fracture. Okay, so what are the features that makes you tell that this is an aggressive lesion? Wide zone of transition of this uh, um, uh, internal veteran or matrix uh, inside the uh, medullary cavity is, is slightly suspicious because I don't appreciate exact boundaries of the normal bone and there's okay. some cortical thinning as well so this, that's why it's suspicious okay 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 so what would you do next what are uh, your would differentials uh, would you like to give any differentials for this uh, this could be a primary bone lesion. Uh, one of the my okay. differentials, this could be a primary bone lesion. Uh, other possible mm -hmm. differential, uh, this could be a metastatic lesion. In that case, uh, metastatic work, if it's not already known, a metastatic workup should be done in case of a female patient, uh, uh, breast ultrasound and CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis can be done. Okay, so what would you do next in terms of imaging for this? Um, uh, post uh, uh, contrast MRI can be done to look for the internal matrix of the bone. Would you look for the matrix on the MRI? 
मैट्रिक बाय मीन आई विल लुक फॉर द लीजन एक्चुअली बिकॉज़ इट विल बी इन द इंटरमेडुलरी लीजन fats at post contrast uh, fats at non contrast first and then i would like to say see fats at post contrast yeah you can scroll through okay okay so um Okay, on this uh, axial T two fat set image, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the level of the shoulder. Now moving down, mm -hmm. we can see significant edema into the uh, muscles of the shoulder, uh, anterior subscapularis muscle around along the bicep tendon, around the humerus. Now uh, the this edema along with soft tissue edema, there does appear to be. abnormal hyper intense signal into the intramedullary cavity mm -hmm. with uh, uh, now i am at the site of uh, the fracture in which i can appreciate cortical disruption with this abnormal mm -hmm. sig intramedullary signal seen uh, to extend to the adjacent soft tissues mm -hmm. and further down this signal is extending inferiorly as well into the bone and there appear to be some cortical thinning along the lateral border of the humerus and significance of tissue edema is there okay and distally the bone look at the thick contrast yeah so this is a coronal post contrast e1 fat set image in which i can appreciate there is displaced fracture of the mid shaft of the humerus with the uh, mm -hmm. uh, abnormal signals can be detected proximal and distal to the fracture site which yeah. are suspicious for some mm -hmm. aggressive lesion because there is some cortical mm -hmm. thinning as well mm -hmm. so what is your final diagnosis so this is a pathological fracture which is secondary to um um uh, uh, um aggressive lesion involving the uh, diaphysis of the humerus mm -hmm. what would you Let's do um uh, this should be discussed in uh, oncology mdt and orthopedic mm -hmm. referral should be done mm -hmm. okay okay and a staging ct yeah uh, yeah maybe staging ct okay so this is a patient a young patient who is presented with heel pain okay so i am presented with a lateral radiograph of right uh ankle and of a patient presented with heel pain uh i don't appreciate any abnormal fracture line involving the calcaneum no abnormal lytic lesion or sclerosis or seen within the calcaneum the adjacent talus naviculum naviculum bone and distal end of the tibia however there is significant soft tissue swelling is uh, uh, noted in the um, soft tissues of uh, is an uh, ankle joint anteriorly as well as posteriorly so uh, i would mm -hmm. like to look at the further other view okay you can have a look at the other view okay on uh, this uh, in this view i can appreciate a subtle sclerotic line in the mm -hmm. distal part of uh, the posterior part of the calcaneum which is suspicious okay. for some stress fracture okay. and uh, soft tissue swelling is also there and mm -hmm. uh, there uh, uh, there is another pathology which uh, appeared to be a pathology but i would like to confirm it if there is some lytic Areas involving one that's of the projection. That is okay. That's 
so this yeah. can be a stress fracture calcaneum with adjacent soft tissue edema okay so what would you do uh this uh, need to be communicated um to the to the referring physician then he uh, orthopedic physician which would manage accordingly okay okay so this is a patient who is come for a routine health checkup okay so i am present with the frontal uh, radiograph chest of adult patient in which i can appreciate there is a a uh, well defined opacity along the left paratracheal region uh, in which the medial border of the opacity uh, is uh, not is separable from the adjacent mediastinum and uh, however the lateral border appears smooth there is no abnormal calcification or cavitation within this lesion overlying uh, bones i can uh, trace through the cortex of the overlying bone and this uh, the part of the opacity can be seen over the adjacent clavicle so i am suspecting that the uh, cervical thoracic sign is positive this could be a posterior mediastinal lesion and uh, uh, the I cervical think... thoracic sign is positive or negative i can see it through the uh, about the clavicle so that is positive yeah you can continue yeah so this appears to be a posterior mediastinal lesion Uh, mm -hmm. further uh, on my normal practice i would like to look at the lungs i don't see any other opacity within the uh, pulmonary opacity or any mm -hmm. hilar lymphadenopathy cardiac size appear normal right paratracheal region appear normal uh, clavicle left clavicle appear intact however the uh, lateral end of the right clavicle is slightly obscured by overlying markers so i couldn't exactly comment on that um, further what are your differentials like So this could be a neurogenic tumor. Mm -hmm. um, other a neurogenic tumor. This could be neuroenteric cyst or um, maybe a, or maybe a, a para para spinal lesion. Mm -hmm. Other less likely possibility. This could be a superior mediastinal mass extending from the neck. However, no direct extension is visualized in this projection. Would further like to do cross-sectional imaging okay. for this patient. It's a spot image. So this uh, is a spot image uh, of a contrast in an CT scan, in which I can appreciate this appear to be a um, cystic uh, uh, density lesion involving the left paratracheal space. Um, it is showing some curvy linear. Uh, this may be a curvilinear. Uh, this can be a curvilinear enhancement, or I I think it's a curvilinear calcification around it. Um, mm -hmm. No, at this point I don't see any. Uh, but this is not the level of the foramen, but I don't see any extension into the new adjacent neural foramen. Uh, this mm -hmm. is causing mass effect on adjacent trachea and esophagus. This could be a, a bronchogenic cyst or foregut cyst or cystic lesion of the mediastinum. Okay. Uh, i don't see any abnormal calcification mm -hmm. uh um my uh, differential of a neurogenic tumor is down the list for, uh, for uh, uh, considering this spot image okay so what would you do um so ideally this should be um uh, discussed with thoracic uh, surgery team and the pulmonary team to if they can aspirate it through the bronchoscopic approach and interventional radiologist should also be involved to look for any okay. approach okay so uh, this was a patient who had an abnormal antenatal scan you can scroll through okay can i see the axial photos Uh, I want you to see that one first, please. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is a MRI abdomen of a neonate with anti uh, with a abnormality detected on antenatal scan, in which I can appreciate there is 
liver appears normal to me. All bladder is fine. Right kidney is slightly uh, enlarged in size. However, uh, left kidney is not visualized. I can appreciate multiple cystic areas involving at the uh, in the left renal fossa, which mm -hmm. could be uh, multicystic dysplastic kidney. As these okay. in this condition, the kidney is replaced by multiple cysts. Mm -hmm. um, spleen appears slightly enlarged in size. I would like to take the size and document it according to the size. Otherwise, there is no abnormal dilatation of bowel loops. Urinary bladder looks okay. There's no hydronephrosis process on right side. So, in sequence, um, which other sequence would you like to see? Uh, in this, um, maybe T2 axial? Yeah, you can have a look. On T2 axial, I further confirm there is enlarged uh, right kidney with uh, cystic replacement of the left kidney. Now, no hydronephrosis noted bilaterally. Right kidney may be enlarged due to compensated hypertrophy. And so uh, does, does this confirm your diagnosis or any other? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, um, it confirms my diagnosis. And in my normal okay. practice, I would look for any genital abnormalities as well. OK, so uh, what would you do for this patient? Uh, so in this patient, um, a, a nuclear scan can be done. However, these multi dysplastic kidneys are usually non-functional, but to look for residual function of the disease. And uh, I would like to uh, evaluate this patient for genital abnormalities as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, yesterday I think we've come to the uh, end of your uh, cases. How did you find the cases? Uh, they were very mixed, random, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think you've done well. So this was a multicystic dysplastic kidney. Mm, so it's a small kidney with a renal parenchyma is not well visualized. And like you told, there is compensatory hypertrophy of the right kidney. And you will look for uh, the genital. And uh, we also, this can be associated with PUG obstruction on the contralateral side. So that is one thing that a nuclear medicine would help. However, we can see that there is no obvious PUG obstruction that is noted on yeah. this, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, usually the kidney will involute by itself, you know, uh, by the time yeah. they reach uh, adulthood. Yeah. And this was a posterior mediastinal mass. So we can see that the uh, lateral margin of the mass is uh, well made out uh, from the lung. So it is sharply marginated. So this is negative cervicothoracic so sign, right? This is not positive. So this is negative. When it is posterior okay. mediastinal, it's a negative cervicothoracic sign, right? Okay. So uh, okay. you told this could also be a superior mediastinal mass extension, but when you see it so clearly, that means it's, it's posterior, right? Okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we shouldn't give a diagnosis of a, a, a differential of a superior mediastinal mass. And uh, like you give a uh, neurogenic tumor, paravertebral abscesses, neurotrix cyst. Uh, another thing would be a lateral uh, thoracic meningiosis. That is yeah, another meningitis. differential that, yeah, uh, that we need to think of. And uh, again, on the CT, uh, like you told, um, correctly mentioned the mass effect and its fluid attenuation. So we wouldn't be thinking of a, a neural, uh, a neural um, tumor, no, a neurogenic tumor. So this was an esophageal uh, duplication cyst, right? Okay. Fluid yeah. attenuation. So yeah, that was right. And uh, so... Rather than bronchoscopic, I think uh, an endoscopic approach would be warranted in this patient rather than okay. a bronchoscopic, right? But, uh, and we could also do an MRI just to confirm that, uh, you know, the uh, contents are clear and there are no septations, no other extension, just for the sake of completion. Okay. Otherwise, it was fine. Yeah, and this was a stress fracture. It's very subtle, but can you make out this? Yeah, and now lantern. retrospective. Retrospectively, yeah. And uh, the soft tissue is fine. Uh, I don't know. Is this what you were talking about? It's fine. Yeah, if you see the, okay. yeah, if you see the fat planes are maintained, right? 
there is no uh, bulging. The fat planes are maintained, even the Kegel's fat is all maintained. So the soft tissue is fine. And you wouldn't really expect a lot of soft tissue edema with a stress fracture, right? So yeah. uh, this is, yeah. So if we do not see it, and if you're not very confident, you can suggest an MRI because they can be occurred on X-rays. But here we are seeing the sclerotic line. So this is a stress fracture that was uh, well picked up. And so in this last that week, you said, uh, suggest the uh, orthopedic referral, right? Because if orthopedic, I'm not... Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Orthopedic referral because they'll have to, uh, you know, rest. Uh, basically, rest is all they do. Yeah. So, okay. And this, uh, so there is a lesion here, right? So when you see a lesion here, you need to uh, tell all of this wide zone of transition. I'm thinking of an aggressive lesion. All of that has to come in a flow, okay. right? Anytime we see a bone lesion, you have to say all of those. Uh, there is a pathological fracture, if there's any soft tissue component and all of that. So this is an aggressive looking lesion, but we need to tell all of, especially all this white zone of transition, all of that has to come automatically, the matrix. And MRI okay. is done, Rukpa, like you told, the intramedullary component, the extent of the intramedullary uh, component, if there is any involvement of the neurovascular bundle, and to look for the extent of soft tissue involvement, right? Yeah. Not for looking for the matrix. We should not, in, uh, you know, tell anything about matrix on the MRI. Matrix is on the, uh, oh, the, uh, the X-ray, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, since uh, we are seeing a part of the chest, you have to tell that the appear, you know, visualized uh, lungs appear normal because a yeah. common thing that we can see is, you know, a lung cancer. We have to look very carefully for any uh, small lesion which could be a lung cancer with this being a metastasis, right? Okay. So on the MRA, again, uh, you just uh, confirm all our findings. We can see that there is intramedullary lesion. It's much more than what we saw on the X-ray, if you X can appreciate it. Yeah, so that is what we look for on the MRA, to look for neurovascular bundle, to look for the extent of the lesion, and to look for any skipped lesions. So these okay. are the indications for what we do in MRA, and we have to ask for a screening. Uh, CT of the chest, right? yeah. chest, abdomen, and pelvis, because we don't know this could be a metastasis as well. Now, on this, uh, yeah, so this, there is positive of bubble loops. So we are thinking of SIDs. And uh, on the CT, it is subtle, maybe not very evident, but there is peritoneal thickening and nodularity, which, uh, you know, you did pick up later. And this is a dermoid. This is a dermoid with a calcification that was also picked up. So this was a primary peritoneal carcinomatosis. The differentials oh. you can give would be a mucinous tumor with peritoneal metastasis. This could be a malignant degeneration of the dermoid with okay. malignant necitis and peritoneal um, involvement. Another thing, you did mention the appendix. Another thing that you need to look for is the gallbladder because gallbladder cancers can also present this way. Okay. So adenocarcinoma of the gallbladder is another thing. So you have to look at the gallbladder carefully, right? And yeah. uh, less likely would be like a uh, peritoneal mesothelioma or a tuberculosis. We cannot rule this out, but these have to yeah. be given as dimensions as well. Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, how many tests the next one? Yes, so this was a uh, this was a MAC3 scan. So how we differentiate between uh, MAC3 is the dynamic. So we will see that there is filling up of the bladder. All right? yeah. If it is DMSA, there won't be filling up of the bladder. So that's how we differentiate between MAC3 and DMSA. And like you correctly told, so these, when we look for the kidneys, no, it's usually the posterior projection because the yeah, kidneys this... are located posteriorly. Yeah. yeah, so this is the left kidney. Right? Yeah. And like you yeah. told, there is obstruction. There is no, even at one point, uh, one and a half hours, there is no uh, flow excretion of the contrast. So you need to say, I'm thinking of a pelvic erectile junction obstruction. A PUJ obstruction is what we would be expecting, right? So you did yeah. say obstruction, but you know, so you can. I don't see any dilatation. I don't know. I was thinking about if there is any dilatation, the pelvis should be. I don't know. Maybe I'm expecting much from a nuclear scan. Yeah, yeah, and th that is another one. Rather than suggesting an ICU, we would do an ultrasound, right? If we saw this, we would do an ultrasound and you would could pick it up. 
okay i thought antenatal uh, ultrasound was done maybe antenatal so. ultrasound was done but now we have okay. the baby to the you know, in front yeah, of us right. so yeah, we would do right. an ultrasound the, rather than exposing the child to more ivu so we would just do an ultrasound yes so in pediatrics not just pediatrics in any case we have to try to limit the radiation so an ultrasound would help us to find and this was a retained surgical swab gossipedoma okay okay so these are the uh, radio dense uh, linear radio dense things which are usually seen within the gauze with these air foci this is quite a characteristic appearance and when you get this and if you're not sure you can always look at the x ray which makes it easier does this yeah. make it easier yeah so this was a retained a uh, surgical swab which is a surgical emergency they will have to open up and uh, retrieve this right so when you get this kind of a thing and if you're not very sure but you did you did say that this is an isolated collection it is not a bubble it is not continuing with a bubble so this is the we usually see it on the uh, x ray but this is the ct appearance okay so okay. this is what it looks like when we see these hyperdense uh, material with these air foci this is quite characteristic for a uh, retained Gossip surgical man. swab yeah a gossipedoma yeah other is well done well done yesra okay, thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much yes uh, yeah. great cases dr nadia dr kashwa you are yeah. next yes hello yeah hi hi are you ready yes uh, okay So this is your first case. I can see the gossiping in case. Do you want me to? Oh, okay. Let me see that just a second. No? Yeah, now I can see it. Yeah. Um, so I've been provided with a frontal pro projection of uh, X-ray abdomen. of a skeletally mature patient in which i can see a uh, markedly dilated uh, loop of bowel um, which is extending from the pelvis uh, superiorly into the imaged part of the upper abdomen um uh in very few hostra are seen otherwise the hostral pattern is lost um mm -hmm. the um distal to this i don't see any air in the rectum proximally i can see that there's quite a bit of uh, uh like the, the colon the rest of the colon it seems to be packed with fecal matter but um i can see um what appears to be the coffee bean sign possibly depicting uh, this is most likely depicting a sigmoid volvulus um so in my normal clinical practice i would uh, want to know the clinical history of the patient is uh, presenting with any acute symptoms um additionally i'm looking for any pneumoperitoneum and i can't see any pneumoperitoneum uh, mm -hmm. so however i'm suspecting a sigmoid volvulus and i would convey my suspicions to the referring physician um this uh, needs to be um if this is the first or the second time then the patient uh, symptoms and findings may be relieved by inserting a rectal flatus tube however if this is a repeated occurrence in this patient then a uh, surgical team needs to be involved and the patient might have to go for surgery okay do you know what is the surgery they do uh i did know but i can't remember it now. okay Okay, no problem. No problem. Let's go to the next case. Yeah. Uh, okay. you can uh request for control. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
extensive uh, osseous abnormality in the form of um, there seems to be thickening of the trabecular pattern uh, that uh, the diploic uh, the, uh, yeah the the trabecular patterns uh, actually it's not the trabecular pattern it seems like uh, there is sort of a sunburst kind of a periosteal reaction, but it's not involving like a single bone. It's involving multiple bones, the left frontal, the bilateral uh, parietal uh, bones, even the occipital bones. And um, I have this impression on this bone window that there is an underlying associated soft tissue abnormality, like a lobulated kind of soft tissue thickening, which in my normal practice, I would evaluate further on the soft tissue window. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another uh, abnormality, similar described abnormality in the left uh, uh, parietal and also in the left temporal bone. So um, it seems like it's basically involving both uh, the inner and the outer table. And it's, it has, in some places it has, appearance of sunburst periosteal reaction or almost newborn formation actually. So I would want to look at the uh, soft tissue window if available to further uh, evaluate the case. Yeah, yeah, you can have a look at the uh, soft tissue window. Okay. So uh, soft tissue window of the same patient uh, demonstrating, so this is the non-enhanced, these are the non-enhanced images of CT brain of the same patient, uh, demonstrating multiple uh, soft tissue masses associated with those described osseous abnormalities. Um, they have, uh, some of them have an, um, but this, the masses, associated masses seem to be extra axial. So some of the soft tissue masses are extending into the cranial cavity, but they seem to have an extra axial uh, location. And some of the masses, they are located projecting outside uh, the cranial cavity. So I'm not really sure if um, uh, what's going on because the, it's involving multiple bones. Sorry, mm -hmm. I need mm -hmm. to switch off this. So it's involving multiple bones, and I'm not really very sure uh, what's going on. Um, it, uh, I don't think it's infection. Um, it seems to be multiple bone lesions with associated soft tissue components. Um, yeah. uh, it's, it's sort of an aggressive uh, pathology, but I'm not sure if it is. It doesn't seem to be infection. It's um, okay. not really sure about the diagnosis. Okay, but it looks aggressive, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Anything that you would want to do further, what would you do? I would, in my normal practice, I would discuss with the referring physician for any, um, okay. any history. Um, mm -hmm. And I could also do an MRI to look for uh, any, of, to further evaluate the soft tissue lesion. I've been provided with a frontal projection of X-ray abdomen of a um, of um, a an, a neonate. No, actually a child. I'm not sure about the exact age. In where there is in which there is marked dilatation of the small and large bowel loops. Um, mm -hmm. I do not see any air in the region of the rectum. Uh, but otherwise, the small and large bowel loops, in particular, the uh, large bowel loops are markedly dilated. Uh, so okay. I, I can't really see any um, pneumoperitoneum or um, any evidence of pneumatosis and cystinalis in this pediatric patient. Uh, I can't see any evidence of uh, cotrivenous gas. Um, uh, so this, this seems to be obstruction. Um, okay. So why do you um, say these are large bubbles? Uh, which, uh, can you trace the large bubbles for me? Which do you think of the dilated large bubble? Uh, so this big loop of bubble here is more centrally uh, located. I can't see your... Uh, you can't see my arrow? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Okay, yeah. can you see now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is the... Uh, 
this would be the small bowel and this okay. would be the descending colon because it's more peripherally located so um, i think this one is not really dilated it's mainly the small bowel that's dilated and it's markedly okay. dilated so okay. um in a new uh, in a child uh, that seems to be quite young looking at the skeletal mm -hmm. features um, I'm mm -hmm. thinking, could this be a form of um, a small bowel, uh, distal small bowel atresia? Um, okay. So I would, in my normal clinical practice, I would ask uh, for any pertinent clinical history. And if mm -hmm. there is suspicion of uh, ileal atresia, I would want to go for a, um, a small bowel series. Uh, coupled with maybe a barium minima to look for features of uh, atresia. Okay, so this is the barium minima. So I've been provided with a frontal projection of a single film of uh, barium minima in the same patient, in which I can see that the uh, um, rec per rectally inserted contrast is extending along uh, the uh, rectum sigmoid colon up till nearly the level of the um, Cecum, uh, and the small and the, uh, the colon is small in caliber. Uh, the, I think there is a bit of contrast which is entering from the cecum into the terminal ileum, which seems to be markedly small in caliber. The terminal ileum mm -hmm. seems to be markedly small in caliber. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, coupled with the findings on the plain radiograph, um, I'm thinking that mm -hmm. this is confirming my suspicion of distal ileal atresia. Okay, what would be your uh, differential for this appearance on the baby? Um, because there are multiple uh, uh, pack, uh, multiple filling defects, which could be suggesting meconium. So I'm thinking um, it could be meconium uh, ileus, uh, in which case I would think of uh, has the patient passed meconium or not. And that would, I would ask the clinician about that. Okay. Uh, how would you differentiate between uh, meconium ileus and uh, ileal atresia on the barium minima? Um, so, I'm not sure. Okay, okay. No problem. I'll go to the next case. Okay, you can scroll through. This is a child uh, who was presented uh, unconscious to the ED. Okay, I've been provided with non-enhanced uh, axial CT brain of a child who's presented with uh, unconscious to the ED, in which I can see uh, multiple hypodense areas uh, surround involving the bilateral basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking for any other further areas of uh, abnormality in the imaged brain. Um, so the rest of the imaged brain, uh, the cerebellum, the pons, medulla oblongata, they seem fine. The rest of the cerebral hemispheres, I can't really see any focal lesions. Coming back to the described hypodense areas in the bilateral basal ganglia, I'm thinking along the lines of um, I mean, I, I, I've noticed that there's no uh, hydrocephalus, there's no midline shift, although some uh, one of the lesions in the left quadrate nucleus is sort of giving an extrinsic uh, uh, compression of the frontal, ipsilateral frontal horn, the left frontal horn. Um, so considering that this child has been brought in to ED with, uh, an in an unconscious state, I'm thinking of any possible um, Poisoning, uh, for example, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, for which suspicion I would want to take a history if there is any such occurrence. Um, um, any differential? Uh, not really. I can't see any calcifications to suggest any. Um, I don't think this is congenital. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. We shall go to the next case. Yeah, the patient has presented with hip pain. Okay. 
Um, I've been pro provided with a frontal projection of a uh, radiograph of the pelvis in which uh, I see that the bilateral uh, acetabuli are uh, flattened uh, and mm -hmm. the bilateral uh, uh, proximal femora are displaced superiorly and there seems to be I get an impression that there is a, a pseudoarthrosis with the bilateral iliac bones. The femoral heads are forming a pseudoarthrosis with the bilateral iliac bones. Um, and as I said, acetabula are flattened and dysplastic um, in this adult patient. Um, evaluating the rest of the bones, um, I don't really see any focal lesions in the other bones, although the right um, lower aspect of the right iliac bone has a sort of uh, uh, heterogeneous appearance, but I don't really see any fractures or any displacements. Um, mm -hmm. I'm evaluating the soft tissue for any abnormality. Um, I don't see any soft tissue abnormality. The sacroiliac joints and the region of the symphysis pubis also pair on the macroid. I don't see any abnormality in that area. So coming back to the um, the uh, described abnormality, possible differentials for the acetabular and femoral abnormalities, which is bilateral, could be a uh, neglected case of uh, DDH. Um, yeah. Considering that it's bilateral and nearly symmetrical, I think the possibility of this being uh, post-traumatic is less likely. Um, okay. Yeah. So what would you do? I would want to look any, uh, at any previous radiographs. Okay, okay. The patient has uh, diarrhea, repeated episodes of diarrhea. I've been provided with a single spot projection of uh, frontal projection of a barium enema in a patient who's presented with repetitive diarrhea, in which I can see that there is a continuous abnormality extending from the, um, nearly from the level of the sigmoid colon, proximally involving the bone of the colon till the level of the uh, terminal bilium. This abnormality has a sort of, um, seems to be involving, it's involving the mucosa. The mucosa has a diffusely abnormal appearance, almost as if there's aphthoid ulcer formation. Um, okay. I do not see any areas of stenosis. Um, there is no areas of obstruction. The contrast has flowed freely into the distal ilia loops. Um, mm -hmm. In the provided projection, I don't see any fistula formation. Um, mm -hmm. So con uh, considering the continuous nature of this abnormality uh, involving uh, from the distal to the, uh, involving the whole of the colon, I'm thinking along the lines of uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, okay. In my normal clinical practice, I would want to ask, uh, I, I would check if there is the patient is known for ulcerative colitis. And I would also look at the other uh, images of the study to look for further uh, complications or findings. Okay, what are the complications that you would expect? I mean, what would you be looking for? In a case of ulcerative colitis, there can be strictures, there can be fistula formation, there can be uh, collections, um, and uh, yeah, those are the main abnormalities. Uh, I've been provided with frontal uh, chest radiograph of a skeletally mature patient in which I can see that there is a uh, dual uh, lead pacemaker in place. Uh, one of the leads is located in the region of the right ventricle. The other lead, actually, I think it's a triple lead pacemaker. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the leads is located in the region of the right ventricle. The other is projecting in the region of the coronary sinus. And I think there is also one located in the right atrium. So I think the leads of the pacemaker are appropriately placed. I can okay. see a dense uh, sort of rounded opacity uh, projecting mm -hmm. in the um, uh, left retrocardiac location. Um, this could be uh, a part of, it, it's rounded, it's, it's sort, it seems sort of uh, heavily, it's a dense, so it's possibly uh, calcified. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it could be representing a partially calcified uh, ventricular aneurysm. Uh, 
Um, okay. It could also be a lung parenchymal look, uh, pathology in the retrocardiac area. Um, I'm just looking okay. at the rest of the film to look for any other abnormalities. Um, the rest of the hemithorax seems fine. Evaluating the bones, um, I can't see any uh, obvious osseous abnormalities. <clears throat> Evaluating the uh, review areas, um, the bilateral apices, the bilateral hyla, the upper abdomen uh, seem grossly unremarkable. So um, the main abnormality is the um, abnormality that I described in the projecting over the left heart uh, region. It could be related to a ventricular aneurysm. It could be a primary lung parenchymal pathology. In my normal clinical practice, I would check if the patient has a lateral view available. I would look at lateral mm -hmm. chest x-ray. I would look at that to further localize There is a lateral view. You can, you can have a look at that. Oh, OK. So um, this uh, opacity is still projecting over the cardiac contour. So I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, calcified ventricular aneurysm. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that it's too densely calcified. Ventricular aneurysm, I would think, would be kind of calcified in the periphery. Um, so okay. to confirm this, um, I could either do a CT scan or I could uh, do an echo to look for the, but I, I would prefer to do a CT scan to look for, because a CT would help me to uh, rule out a ventricular aneurysm or to see if this is some other lesion. Okay, any history that would help you? Any history that you would ask for? Uh, if the patient has any history of prior uh, myocardial infarction, he's predisposed to formation of ventricular aneurysms. Okay, any differentials that you would think of if it is a cardiac lesion? Cardiac lesion? Um, or, uh, okay, let me rephrase it. Uh, would, would, do you think it's a true or a false ventricular aneurysm? Uh, I think it's a most likely a true aneurysm because they are supposed to be, as far as I can remember, they're supposed to be anteriorly located, while false would be sort of posteriorly projecting. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I think we've come and we've come to the end of our uh, cases as well. So this was uh, a ventricular aneurysm, uh, and this is a true aneurysm, like you told. So the history we could always ask for a history of uh, MI and uh, suggest an echocardiogram. And since there's also a pacemaker, you know, so the patient has some cardiac issues, right? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this was an aneurysm. Uh, so like you told, the pseudo uh, aneurysm would be posteriorly located and that is the emergency uh, because it has a, a narrow neck uh, rather than the uh, true aneurysm. So okay. that was well done. Um, and this was ulcerative colitis. Uh, you told everything. Another thing that uh, we need to mention is that there is a loss of the hostra, giving the lead pipe uh, appearance, mm -hmm. and uh, which is, again, uh, characteristic for ulcerative colitis. And in the complications, these patients are known to develop uh, carcinoma of the colon, malignant malignancy mm -hmm. of the colon. So that is one thing that we need to look for. Uh, the uh, fistula and the collections, these are more commonly seen in Crohn's, but uh, in ulcerative colitis, they have higher chance of uh, malignant transformation uh, when compared to Crohn's disease. So that is one thing that we need to look for, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a neglected case of uh, DDH, well picked up, and uh, I think uh, no further discussion. You've, uh, you presented it quite well. And okay, so this was, uh, if you can see, it's bilateral symmetrical involvement, a hypodensity is involving the caudate, the lentiform, and the thalami, right? And the child yeah. was uh, unconscious. So this was actually a hypo hypoxic ischemic insult. Right? Okay. Uh, carbon monoxide, we usually see it in the globus pallidus. It's bilateral symmetrical and it involves the globus pallidus. If you can see here, the globus pallidus is not really involved. It's more of the pitamen and the caudate. You wouldn't get this kind of an extensive uh, involvement in uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, it would be more of the globus pallidus. Okay. So here we can see the thalami are involved and the child is unconscious. So uh, this is a case of, uh, so we need to say the negative history. There is no cerebral edema, there is no herniation. These would be the negative history. These are concerning for a uh, hypoxic ischemic insult, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, this was yeah this was well done so these are small bubble loops these are central there are no horse tray and like you told there is no rectal gas so the large bowel will be peripherally dilated we would see some amount of hostra in children uh, especially young children it's very difficult to differentiate between small and large bubble dilatation uh, if the dilated loops are small or large but these are central there are no hostra so these are more likely to be small bubble and there is no rectal gas shadow so this is suggestive of a distal small bubble obstruction like you told and uh, on the barium enema uh, like you told there is uh, the ileum is narrow in caliber so this was ileal atresia so the way to differentiate is in meconium ileus we would get a normal caliber uh, ileum right in ileal atresia, you would get uh, the small caliber and there would be just reflex into the very terminal ileum and you wouldn't see passage of contrast beyond that. So that is how we differentiate between meconium ileus and ileal atresia. Okay. And, uh, you told the history of uh, passage of meconium ileus as well. So that was also well done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, uh, like you told, these are regressive lesions. These are bony lesions with large uh, soft tissue component. This is a pediatric patient. This is the uh, typical appearance of neuroblastoma metastasis, giving this hair on and speculated appearance, right? Okay. And this okay. is uh, skull metastasis, multiple metastasis from neuroblastoma. So when you get this kind of a picture, uh, if you can see even, you know, the orbital walls, multiple, multiple lesions. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is quite characteristic, the speculated appearance, the hair on and sunburst appearance mm -hmm. with a large soft tissue component. So uh, this will have to be conveyed because uh, there is enhancement, there was post contrast, uh, which you could have seen, and uh, there is a uh, mass effect on the brain. So, this would need an urgent neurosurgical referral because of the mass effect. And along with this, you would say that you would do an ultrasound of the abdomen to look for a neuroblastoma. MIB okay. can also help to look for dissemination, right? Mm -hmm. In a pediatric patient, when you get this kind of a hair on end appearance, multiple skull lesions, you have to think of neuroblastoma metastasis. This was sigmoid volvulus. You told everything perfectly. So the uh, when there are repeated episodes, uh, sigmoidopexy is the procedure that they do, fixing the sigmoid, right? Okay. Sigmoidopexy. But apart from that, it is perfect. So yeah, well done. Well done. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So I think... We Thank you very much, Dr. Nadia. Uh, I mean, amazing collection of cases. Uh, let me stop the recording first.